Hello, hello everybody and welcome to uh, Monday Night uh, Live. Today I've got a very special edition with five fantastic guests, people who've uh, contributed to the one year of the chat show with all sorts of ideas and uh, education, etc. I'm going to introduce them very quickly. Now I'm not sure I'm supposed to do this anymore, but I'm going to introduce them ladies first. That might be non-PC, but I don't know. Um, Jane Gunn. Jane's a mediator, a lawyer, and she was the first female speaker, president of the Professional Speaking Association. Then I've got uh, Gabrielle Gache. Gab Gabby is an NLP master trainer and also a financial advisor for St. James's Place. Then we come to Godfrey Lancashire, who's a private detective. He is um, an MAT, and I'll let him explain what that is at uh, Hardy's School and a number of schools in Dorset, and he's also president of the YMCA in Dorchester, a private detective before he did that. Then we've got Texas Tim Durkin all the way from Glenbury in Texas with his uh, hat on, which apparently scares off the bugs. And finally, we've got Graham Jones, the internet psychologist, a business school lecturer, and holds every award the Professional Speaking Association has ever given anyone. Welcome everybody, welcome to the show. And I'm gonna kick off from the, with the first question, which is, with the exception of hybrid working, what are the changes that you think we will retain when we exit COVID? And uh, I'm gonna ask Graham to uh, handle that question first. Graham Jones. <laughs> Why do you always come to me first? <laughs> um, with the exception of hybrid working, the things that will, um, I think, survive are a focus on mental health um, and the fact that uh, businesses will have to be much more uh, focused on looking after the mental health of their staff. Under health and safety legislation, obviously, we're, as business owners, required to look after the health of your staff, but it's often too been focused on physical things. And I think the whole lockdown thing has focused people's minds much more on, on that. So I think that's going to stay. I think also uh, another thing that is likely to stay is the fact that we're all gonna be shopping from home much, much more. And in fact, I looked at some data this morning showing that the trend for online shopping obviously began before lockdowns started all the lockdowns have done is accelerate it and uh, I suspect we've only just seen the start of the closure of the British High Street I think that uh, unless retailers dramatically change there was a book a few years ago Derek I think it was called Clickology I can't remember but um, in it there was a chapter there predicting that unless retailers changed and delivered something differently the online world would take them over and all that's happened is that COVID has just accelerated that. So I suspect we're going to see much, much, much more online shopping. You know, so uh, the likes of John Lewis announcing that 75% of their business is now online and already looking to close down more stores. Major, major shift in the high street. Sure. Well, we'll see about that. Yeah, it was a great book, Click Clickology. I think you were the author of it, Graham. And I think. It's oh, so I was. <laughs> I think it went to number one in the charts because I put it there when I was in WA yep. Smith and moved it from number 18 to number one, which is what yep. we do for all our friends in the uh, speaking association. Um, while we're on education, let's turn to Godfrey down in Dorset because Godfrey holds a few positions, a number of positions in the education sector and uh, with young people. Godfrey, what do you see changing? Um, I think one of the lessons that's come out of this whole last year is uh, a kindness and communities coming together and one little example it's not so little actually um, I look after I help to look after the governance of four schools and the biggest is uh, an academy that has two and a half thousand students aged between 13 and 18 and uh, throughout the lockdowns and throughout the holidays, um, the catering team, with help from students, produced food parcels for the community. And they must have produced by now over uh, between four and 5,000 food parcels. And contrary to local and other press you may have seen, these food parcels were substantial. 
Uh, there was meat, chicken, cheese, rice, bread. In fact, the head of catering worked out it was enough for a family for a week. And in the very difficult times, the uh, school site team delivered. So these were food parcels produced and delivered. Um, and in parallel, the IT team, uh, again, contrary to what you see in some of the media, were already right from a March a year ago, uh, repairing free uh, laptops and devices that parents were taking in to a special part of the school and distributing and making sure that all the students uh, had a device. Because I think we may have mentioned uh, a little while ago, uh, whereas it used to be for Derek, a blackboard and white chalk, I, I had moved on to paper and pen, but now actually every student needs a device. And this was going on, not just in the schools that we look after, but in the community. So I see um, community help and kindness um, being a real positive that's come out of this terrible period, and I think it will continue. Fantastic, Godfrey. Thank you for that. Uh, actually, uh, when I was at school, it was uh, tablets of stone that you had to scratch on just for the uh, just for the record. Uh, thanks. For, thanks for that. Um, what's happening, Jane, in the mediation world and how do you see that going? Uh, thank you, Derek. Well, I have been involved in quite, as you can imagine, quite a lot of workplace debates and conflicts. So there's a lot and there's a lot of tension at the moment about how organisations are going to manage staff coming back from a third lockdown. Some people are reluctant. Some people have loved working from home and realised that they're, you know, they rather like not meeting other people. So they'd rather stay at home. Um, other people can't wait to get back and there's the whole issue around what does a safe workplace look like and what if people feel scared coming into work what if they say they won't travel on public transport lots and lots of issues um, around that which are really only just being played out so that's interesting and i think the interesting thing from my perspective is are organizations able to have a proper open dialogue with their staff or are they becoming very authoritarian this is the way we're going to do it um uh, just be, just for speed and sort of simplicity so there's a whole lot playing out around how do we relate to staff around completely new issues that haven't been uh important before wow it's going to be a lot of work for you jane there i feel <laughs> there is quite a lot of work for me already yes exactly so um that's quite interesting and then again you know this whole thing around relationships at home many of us have had to work in close proximity with our partners. I married you for life and not for lunch has been the, the mantra. And so, you know, we're going to be carrying on with a lot more homeworking than we previously anticipated. How do we manage those relationships and boundaries with our spouses, partners and children? So lots of relational issues. Absolutely. And uh, let's let's move across the pond to Texas and uh, Tim Durkin. Well, one of, one of the things that we're seeing here um, is will they go back? In Texas, we have opened up a no mask policy. But interesting, most people still wear masks and most businesses can say you have to wear a mask or not. Uh, but even though we don't have to wear a mask, we are the 13th state. There are now 19 of the 50 states that allow math to be maskless. Uh, most people still wear the mask. But the big issue is a real estate issue, and that is, will people go back to the office when they have a chance? It's estimated that 90% actually will, but 70% say that they won't. Um, when this has happened before, everybody said, most everybody said they wouldn't, but they ended up doing it. Now, there will be one exception, and well, there's two issues there. The one exception is New York City. Four out of the five people say they're not going to go uh, back to the office in New York City, which as you might well imagine, probably with London too, it's a very onerous commute. It's a one and a half, sometimes longer commute. So they might not go back, but I think the socialization is going to make everybody wanna come back, plus the what's called FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. But the monkey wrench in that idea is that most companies are now downsizing their office space and their 
not renewing the leases. So there will be far less room if people do want to come back. So it's going to be pretty ish, a pretty big issue. I think people are going to want to come back. I taught last week and I taught the week before that. And I will tell you that the people in that room were very happy to be together once again. And there was a tremendous positive energy. And I think you'll see that. Tim, you jumped on a couple of planes you were telling me last week as well, one to, uh, to both, both parts of um, Texas. Um, how was the plane journey? Um, it was as crowded as it is on uh, what we call Thanksgiving, which is the busiest travel day of the year, and is as busy as Christmas. Now, part of the reason that it's busy is because the airlines have cut down on the number of routes that they are running. I flew to Amarillo, Texas. Normally I can pick six different flights any day. Uh, there's only one, uh, but it was extremely crowded in the airports. But um, as Godfrey is saying, there's a, there's, a real la there's a real large amount of kindness, compassion, politeness um, that, that's noticeable, it's palpable. So that's interesting, very busy flight. Very busy airport. Where is Amarillo? I remember someone singing, show me the way to Amarillo once. But... Yes, Amarillo is up in the panhandle. It's in that part of Texas that's very square. It's, it's kind of at the bottom of that, um, but it's, uh, it's a nice town. It's very Western. Um, and I went even further up North, which is even more cowboy. Um, oh, the other thing that we have uh, that's happening in COVID and Ava could probably speak to this, at least in Texas, interest rates are very low. People are getting 30 bids. They'll put their home for sale and they will get up to 30 bids, every one of them starting at asking price, many going over, uh, many cash items. It's uh, real estate has never been hotter in the States. Wow, we'll uh, we'll bring Ava in later because Ava is a real estate agent or an estate agent in in our language over here. Uh, now turning to Gabrielle, Gabby, are you there? Gabby, what's I going on indeed. in the financial and the coaching world? Um, okay, so they're completely different. Um, in the financial world, we are busier than ever. I think a lot of people who um, we are very rich today much richer than ever before. The, the spendable cash is greater for the majority of people. Obviously, those that have been furloughed, those that have lost their jobs, it's a very worrying time. But for those that are secure in their, their roles, they're not going on holiday, they're not getting the takeouts, they're not paying for their coffees five quid a day. So there is more cash available. And I was reading a statistic the other day and there, there are now 33 point whatever million more savers in the UK as a result of COVID. Um, and that is purely because people aren't spending, for me, it's 40 quid to get to London per day. I'll probably spend a fiver at the station on, on a coffee and breakfast. And then I'll get to London and I'll spend tenner on lunch in Pret or Eat or wherever. And, and all of that money is now being saved by the majority of people. So finance is in, in a good space. Um, considering the economy just plummeted when COVID happened in March, it's recovered and some and is doing remarkably well. I'm sure uh, Justin went into the details of it all, so, but it looks like a very positive couple of years ahead of us as well. On the coaching side of things, it's been really interesting because a lot of people um, are now working from home. So the, co the shift in coaching has been from, you know, whatever their day job was to how the hell do I present and how do I work this machinery? Um, and how can I get my, my message across via a flat screen that's 2D? Um, people have got used to that now, and they're now going back to the, the type of coaching that we used to do before around the real issues and where is the business going? Because what we're noticing is that there's a real shift of the types of jobs that people are doing. 
um, because companies that are not um, geared up for, for COVID are going under. Um, so what do you do? You know, if you've, if you've been used to being a highly paid executive for someone, let's say in the motor trade, the motor trade is struggling at the moment. So where do you go? So it's been really working on what are the skills that are available that they have that are available or needed in, across in different industries and in different areas of business. And are you um, inundated with people trying to take out ice, ices at the moment? A couple of things for Tim there. A quid is a pound. I think you might know that, Tim. And um, an ISA is a tax free investment, which you have to put your money into by uh, next week or the week after. Yeah, ISAs and pensions, paying into pensions, because um, pensions gets a really good tax return, um, tax uplift. So both the both ISAs and pensions are tax free. Um, but, you know, it's a uh, it's a busy, busy time of the year. There's also a number of biz people that are selling have sold their businesses. So there are a lot of millionaires and multimillionaires being made even though we are in COVID times, you know, the businesses have been sold in the midst of it all. Um, and I had a, a number of clients that when it all kicked off, they were, oh my God, you know, everything's gonna fall apart. We've been working to build the, to sell the business for the last two to three years. They've gone through, no problem. And some of them, they've actually made more than they thought because there was a bit of a, a bidding war over the businesses. So. From a financial perspective, it's really business as usual. Great. Okay. Thanks for that. From my point of view, um, I ran this uh, all day masterclass on Zoom. People were ready for it. They were up for it and uh, it went really well. I didn't have the nerve to run a role play. I was going to run a role play, but we, we, ran out of, uh, we ran out of time. I also know somebody who put their flat on the market uh, uh, and... Um, Luckily, the estate agent said offers in the region of and they got 10% more by the agent starting a bidding war and got a cash purchaser. So uh, so that's very interesting. So that's the same experience that that Tim's having, which is um, which is fascinating, but a bit worrying because house prices are pretty expensive in the UK. It's interesting because in London, the house prices have dropped um because people are wanting to move out of london so it's yeah. it really does depend on on where you are i think the, the the greener the space providing there are good communication links because most people are happy to work from home and that will be the new norm but they will also need to be going in to work from time to time for the odd meeting um so green space but with good communication links to the cities they're good places. Second, second homes are becoming first homes. Yeah, exactly. And uh, one bedroom flats in London will probably go up in price. Yeah. Mm, it's interesting. A pal of mine's got his son's trying to sell his one bedroom flat by Brookwood Station, which is a really good commuter station, but he can't sell it. So uh, mm. again, out of town, one bedroom flats are probably no good because you can't, uh, yeah. you haven't got a study. So the whole well, paradigm is changing. Um, what will happen is a lot of the offices in London, um, it, you know, it was mentioned that uh, people are downsizing. A lot of the offices are going to be converted into residential. So, you know, Alan, who's an architect and, and his colleagues, they're going to be very busy um, changing use of some of these properties. I'm going to go to Graham now. Those of you that don't know Graham as well as I do, he sends out a fantastic newsletter every Saturday morning at exactly 10 o'clock. I don't know how he does that. And he's been doing that for a lot longer than I, <laughs> I've been doing. But Graham, in last week's newsletter, I was fascinated to read that you've been making notes about what people have been saying. And your notepad is littered with words like, I'm back, return, past what we used to do the old way. No one appears to be looking forward and backwards facing words are coming out of people's subconscious brain, still mm. talking about the past. What did you mean by that? Well, when you, when you think about uh, 
your brain and your subconscious, your subconscious brain is trying to keep you safe the whole time. It's trying to protect you and ensure that you don't have any issues and problems that could threaten your very existence. And so what it's trying to do all the time is to keep you safe. And one thing we know about safety is that you are safer in environments which you understand and know and understand the risks of and so on. So everything you do is looking to be in that safe space. Now, you might not think you're doing that, but your subconscious brain is definitely doing that. Um, and so it's trying to keep you safe the whole time. New things are have unknown risks. New things are things that we find difficult to cope with. So your brain is trying to not get you to go into those new things because that could be a potential danger for you. So it tries to analyze the risks and it can't do that a lot of the time. So it says, let's play safe and go back to our home comfort. You know, you feel safest in the world in your when you've got all your home comforts. And so um, when you go to those new places, when you're facing new experiences, your brain gets a bit nervous, anxiety increases and all of those kind of things. So when you look at the people's words and you can see the words they're using, the words they use is an indication of what their subconscious brain is saying. So their subconscious brain is saying, when we go back to the office, back is behind you. So that's talking about the past. That's talk of putting your mental frame into what's behind you. Well, I'm going to return to the office. Uh, when we go back to the way we used to do things, it's, this is the way we used to. This is all backward thinking language, which your brain is definitely wanting to you, for you to use, because it's implying that if we go back to the old way of working, we will be safer. The problem is that there is no going back. We're only gonna go forwards and your brain doesn't want to do that. So everything, so all of that kind of, when Tim was saying about, you know, all the people who say they're not going to go back to the office, but they end up going into the office uh, with the businesses also downsizing their offices, there's that conflict in their brain about the, the fact that, uh, for example, Starbucks announced that they are going to do with their offices what's called hoteling. So nobody will have an office. Uh, they will dramatically reduce their office size and you book a room. So if you need a room for a meeting a week on Tuesday, you book it just like you'd book a hotel room. That's the future of offices, but that's really discomforting to us. And so what people are doing is they're going into the office now because actually by doing that, it's taking them psychologically back to that area of safety. And it's that conflict between the future and the past that is difficult for your brain to get. Thanks, Grant. By the way, I nearly sm I smashed something up there. If you were wondering what the noise was, um, I was trying to find the power lead for my computer to make sure it didn't crash and uh, I dropped something all over the floor. I don't know what it. I don't know uh, what it is. So, Grant, should we be using forward-looking language for our own unconscious yeah. subconscious mind? Because then you can start fooling your subconscious into that. That's a bit more normal. So, say I'm going into the office. I'm looking forward to going into the office. All of those kind of words will start getting you, or I'm looking forward to booking the office as a hotel space in the same way as a hotel space. So what Starbucks is doing with its headquarters is doing that. And if people say, I'm going back to the office, they're not going to have that going back experience. So convince their brain that they're going forwards and it becomes a little more comforting for your brain. I think we'll, um, we'll question Gabby about that when it's her turn about using um, forward thinking language or present tense for, yep. for the future. Um, but now we turn back to Godfrey. It's Godfrey's turn um, as uh, president of the YMCA, but also living in a village with 150 people, one pub and um, no, no village store. Godfrey. I just want to pick up on uh, something about education and relationships, something that's just sparked off. It's the great beauty of being with friends like this. Uh, one idea sparks off another. But I did read something very interesting in the educational world. There's been a, a survey. I don't know how widespread, but of course, uh, the schools in the UK have now gone back and a huge sigh of relief by a lot of parents who've been homeschooling 
But on the other hand, uh, I understand um, between a quarter and a third of mothers have said um, how much better the relationships were with their children, simply because they'd spent a much longer time with the family doing things that they wouldn't normally do. And I just thought that was quite telling. And I would hope that some of that carries forward. That's just a little aside, but Derek mentioned um, I uh, look after Dorchester YMCA. Um, it's one of the oldest and the very first to be founded in the country, founded in 1868. Uh, so we, we went through our 150th a couple of years ago. And we would expect to look after about 600 young people uh, every week. And for the best part of a year, of course, we've had none. And our next opening, we hope, will be April the 19th, and it'll be on very limited usage. So like a lot of businesses, although we're a charity, uh, we have to run it as a business. Um, we've had all our monthly expenses, uh, no income. Uh, we've got 20 staff on furlough. And so we've had to think of best practice. And one thing that hasn't changed for 100 years or more is definitely cash is king. And uh, two years ago, we were about to embark on a building project uh, to extend our premises. We, we're, we're successful, need more room. And we uh, got a lot of donations. We had recruitment drives and we had a pot of cash. And then, of course, uh, COVID hit. And we made, I think, the sensible decision to, to ring fence that pot of cash in case we needed to dip into it just to keep the operation going. Uh, well, luckily with some grants and some very prudent management, um, we have just about managed uh, to keep going without dipping into that pot, but it is still ring fenced. And the very nice thing is because we can now see our way to opening gradually after Easter through the summer towards the back end of the year, we're spending a little bit of that money to upgrade the uh, male and female changing rooms to put in new showers and a new staff room so that when the staff particularly come back towards the end of April um, it will give them a morale boost and they'll come back and see refreshed premises and nice facilities for them and uh, we think that will give everybody a boost and it's a little part of our original plan but we've still ring fenced this pot of cash. And um, of course, I'm a banker. The first part of my career, 25 years, was uh, uh, with Barclays like Derek. And um, it's as true today as it was then. Cash is king. And that's why I think you've got people, Gabby mentioned, people selling real estate, selling businesses. They've got a pot of cash. And I think a little bit of that is because of the uncertainty. If they've got the cash, they can move very quickly in a new direction or do what they want to do. So uh, it's a little lesson I think um, has come out and, and we're pleased to have uh, made the decisions that we did. Thanks, Godfrey. And congratulations on doing that and congratulations all, on all the work you do for your uh, young people. Can I turn to Jane now? Jane, um, we talked um, on Friday about power in a negotiation, but I had an interesting question today from a senior practitioner in, in a doctor's surgery and I know your daughter's a doctor as well but um, basically the question is and I'm going to be speaking to the guy tomorrow but it's an interesting question uh, one of the um, one of the doctors is leaving the practice but refuses to negotiate over anything how does how do we deal with that and maybe you could just generalize on that uh, how you would handle that interesting okay well I, just, I lost you no no just to put that in context i'm just currently writing a talk which i'm to give to uepo which is um part of the european commission on intellectual property and we're talking about international conflicts where there's an a power imbalance and, and the question i have to address is as a mediator is it my job to correct a power imbalance um and my conclusion at the moment is that that's not my job, that my job is not to correct a power imbalance. And in fact, power imbalances exist everywhere. And, and, and how would you actually do that? Uh, but my job is as a mediator is to make sure that people are what we're doing, what we call self-determining. They are able to make 
a fully informed decision within the context that they're in. And if I feel that that's being compromised in any way, then my job as a mediator is to address that and to perhaps to further empower them, but always to make sure that they're making a fully informed decision. Um, so to address your question, how do you deal with somebody who won't negotiate? I think you need to just explore why, what is it they're afraid of, what the reasoning always to find out what's the reasoning behind it and what's the outcome they want. I always start with that question. What outcome are you trying to achieve? How do you think you would better achieve that? Uh, you know, what are their concerns about negotiating? You know, they may be feeling there's a power imbalance there. So again, how would you address that? Is that is that a question that you could address with some of these thoughts about um, uh, better empowering someone to self-determine? And that can be about all sorts of different things that I was looking at. It can be. I'm worried there'll be so many people on the other side of the table. I'm worried they'll pay, have more money to pay for legal advice than me. I'm worried they'll have more information and data than I've got. All sorts of things create the perception of a power imbalance, which makes someone feel less, as, as Graham was saying, less safe in that negotiating environment. So those might be some things to look at, Derek. Great, Jane. Thanks for that. Yep. Yeah, no, I was going to ask the question why straight away, but um, absolutely uh, right. Um, if Tim, Tim, if Texas Tim's there, I think we all want to know what's happening to uh, Joe Biden. We haven't heard from him for a bit. We're not going to ask you, certainly not going to ask you about the issue that's in every paper in the UK and what the view is in the in the US about our princess. But um, Tim. What's going I'd love on? to talk to you about that, but um, because I do have strong feelings about that. But regarding our president, just keep in mind that um, you are hearing the views of a center right person, uh, liberal, conservative and financial and freedom issues. So with that qualification, um, I will say we're very concerned. We have not heard from him in 50 days, which is longer than any president for more than 100 years. He has not taken a, a single question. It, wait, I correct. He did take a question He after one of his speeches. He turned around to answer and his handlers literally took him by the elbow and escorted him away. There is very serious questions about the man's cognitive decline. He cannot go off script or nobody knows exactly what he will say. So that's gonna be something to watch in the coming months. Um, he said he'll, his handlers, and that's basically what it is. They're not assistants, they're, they're just escorting him around. They say he'll probably have a press conference by the end of March, but he's very busy handling the vaccine rollout, which is cr crazy on its face. Um, he has, for example, when Texas opened, went maskless, when that announcement was made, um, the president called that Neanderthal. The very next day, he issued an executive order ordering the release of 25,000 immigrants waiting at the border. A significant percentage of people of that 25,000 were COVID positive and they were just simply released into um, the, the Texas population. So th that kind is, that's concerning. The other concerning is that the price of gasoline, which is still far, far lower than what you pay for petrol in the UK. Um, it has gone up a penny a day um, ever since he took office because he stopped the major pipeline, which cost uh, 10,000 10, jobs within Texas. That city that I visited last week, uh, absolutely decimated. It went immediately into a, a depression economy because it's very tied to the energy industry. So uh, um, we're, we're a little bit concerned, even those of us who were hoping for the, the best. He promised bipart bipartisanship and transparency, and that has not happened at all. And the $1.9 trillion stimulus package, 
approximately 6% of that amount is for COVID uh, relief. The rest is what we call in the United States pork. It's, um, it's money to other people's favorite projects. So um, things, are, things are a little dicey now. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very disappointing. Oh, and he just announced today uh, the biggest tax hike since 1993. And he is edging toward the topic of gun control and I don't think you want me to get started. On no, that. we don't want you. Get, we'll leave that one out for <laughs> another day. And yeah. um, Tim told me when we were chatting on uh, last night, Sunday night, um, that uh, he has to drive a hundred miles to get his second COVID jab next week. Um, but then he told me that petrol's about two pounds a gallon in the U.S. It's been creeping up a penny. So well, it, it's two dollars. Two dollars fifty-seven. Oh, that's probably, uh, yeah. That's, that's about a quarter of yours. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. What a shame about the pipeline. Okay, better keep, better keep going because um, we're running out of time. This is uh, fascinating. Don't forget to put your questions in the chat box for any of the extraordinary panel that we have on today. Um, I'd like to go to Gabby now and um, talk about that psychology that we were talking about, about timelines and present tense and how you can fool, fool your unconscious brain. So, um, I mean, Graham covered it beautifully. Uh, the thing about timelines is they, they are using your imagination and your imagination is very, very powerful. If you have an experience, actually you do something or you just imagine yourself doing something vividly creates the same connections in the brain. So, so the power of the mind is phenomenal. So this idea of moving forward rather than going back to the office, going forward into the office and looking forward to what life will be is, is really a matter of starting to imagine, starting up with, in my coaching, I say to people, they're generally UK based, and we're going to step into the TARDIS and we play a little bit of Doctor Who and we step into the TARDIS and we come out at their retirement, for example. What will life be like? What will you be doing? How will you be playing? Who will you be playing with? Um, and it's, it's thinking about how you want, what qualities you want in your life moving forward. And I think this whole experience that we've all been through has been very very unique for each and every one of us and it's for many people made them realize the things that are important to them the time with the family I loved Jane's um, I married you for life not for lunch I've actually really enjoyed my lunches because that's been something that's been very special um, equally you know that the communication with my family my family all live desperate in various different parts of the world, um, we're more in contact now than ever before because this becomes the norm. So it's thinking about what do you want your norm to be like going forward and talking about it as though it is already. The more you talk about it as though it is already because we have everything available to us. It's, it is, stepping into the future and making those pictures, seeing the things that you want to see, hearing the sounds that you want to hear, um, the messages that you want to hear, hearing yourself giving the messages to other people and really getting the sensations that you want to feel. Very often you can go back in time and this idea of going back is very comforting for many because it, it, it's an area where we feel secure. So sometimes you can go back to reassess and to reflect on what are the things that make you feel whole and wholesome that you want to then take forward into your future. I think many people have done this unconsciously uh, as a result of this experience, but to actually take some time out and reflect 
around what are the things that are important to you and how can you make sure that they become part of your daily routine. I was listening to something the other day and they were talking about motivation, um, inspiration and discipline. A, a dear friend of mine, Owen Fitzpatrick, and we, we all get inspired, we all have motivation for certain things, but discipline is the thing that will enable you to get the life that you want. We can be inspired or motivated with our business, but there'll be parts of the business that we don't necessarily like, picking up the phone, sending the emails. And I've got coaches that don't send invoices. They don't invoice for their work. <laughs> with my financial hat on. <laughs> and, and it's because they don't like that work. They're not inspired by that work. And they wonder why their coaching business isn't really thriving. It's creating discipline and creating routine around those disciplines as you move forward. So a great question to ask yourself. If you were living your ideal life, what would the perfect day look like? What would the perfect week look like? What would the perfect month look like? And what would the perfect year look like? Because there will be some things you want to do monthly, there might be one or two things that you want to do annually. So just to break it up. And I remember doing this exercise um, God, back in the 1980s. And uh, I, live, I live my perfect life, you know, it's, but it's be, what, are you aware of it? Are you aware of what you want to be achieving on a day-to-day -day basis? And use the language as if it is already here. Yeah, that's one of the things I enjoyed more about my uh, NLP practitioner certificates, learning uh, how to change the language. Um, and as Tracy Hooper said, uh, um, what words you're going to lose and what words you're going to use because it affects you and it affects everybody else, those, mm -hmm. that language and those words. But it's, uh, it's really a way of um, fooling the brain, isn't it, with using your imagination that it's, it's for real and it's um, very strange. Um, very strange. <laughs> Make it until you make it is a phrase for a reason. It works. <laughs> make it till you make it. Yeah, that's Amy Cuddy, isn't it, as well? Okay, we've got a few, uh, we've got a few questions in the chat box, but while I look at those, if uh, Eva's there, what's happening, Eva, in the Albuquerque um, property market in New Mexico? Thank you, Derek. There is something, everything that uh, Tim already said is happening here as well. The market is booming, but there is another interesting turn of events, which I have noticed over the last six months, because we have 25 to 30 offers per house. What we notice is that people who are cash heavy are beating out the people who have to get a loan that may not be as desirable for the homeowners. So as a result, we have veterans and first time home buyers and teachers, police officers who are being beaten out of the market altogether, which is sort of an interesting turn of events. Mm -hmm. So there is kind of like that divide, that socioeconomic divide that is coming with this boom. Wow. If that makes sense. It does make sense. I don't sense. know. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I don't know, Derek, if you see this in England as well, but that's even more concerning than the low interest rates and inflation, I feel like, because it's affecting a certain demographic. They, at home. I haven't heard that to that degree, but we've all, always had that actually in a way ever since house prices shot up uh, 30, 40 years ago. So we've had to have social housing. And uh, usually when a builder builds a big block, they have to put so many much cheaper houses in, but I'm not really quite sure that that's fair and how it works. So um, we bite our, bite our but, time. Um, very quickly, Derek, just, just to answer that point, it, it is true that most of the country now will have what is called a local plan. And um, that is input from the residents in that area and consultation and so on. I think actually, if it comes to the crunch, um, uh, the developers would override the local plan. But in most local plans now, there is a requirement to have a, what, what is known in the UK as affordable housing. So if there was a housing development of 100 houses 
Uh, I'm not sure of the ratio, but maybe uh, 10 would have to be affordable. Um, and that is getting gradually built into these local plans, which are how are we going to supply the housing? There's a huge housing need over here. So there's a, there's, there's a need for building, but how do we build? Who do we make the homes available for? But it, it's an interesting point that Eva makes. Yeah, thanks, Godfrey. I'm going to ask Alan. We got Alan uh, McCulloch on here. What's the, what is that? Uh, what is the law, Alan, and what happens in practice? I think you're still. No, you're not on mute. You're okay now. Okay. Yeah. No, it's a good point. I mean, it's a it's gradually ratcheting up in terms of uh, you know it can be thirty percent, could be fifty percent, could be that you're developing four houses and two of them need to be affordable of course affordable doesn't mean say somebody can afford them it just means there's some slightly different uh, uh, finances at play uh, in terms of um, you know it might, it might be against a, a local market rent it's it's judged against that but the problem is it's working against itself because the more you not penalize but the more you put a, a cost on a, a developer course the more reluctant they are to develop because they some of them are frightened of affordable housing you know um so it you know in one one sense the country needs a lot more housing but it's getting the tariffs to actually do it for developers are getting high i mean it has to be so people just need to look you know gabby's just been talking about the future what we need is some developers which are future thinking and say this is the new way We've got to get a head around it. We can't make the profit we made before. We've got to uh, go forward. So, you know, maybe uh, Gabby's talk was should be taken into a residential scenario with developers, and uh, it it really is uh, not 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 working well at the moment. It's interesting. It, it, my I, I'm from Gibraltar. For those of you that don't know, and in Gibraltar they they housing market is explosive and they have built i mean i haven't been there for a year i've managed to pop over in december in that window of opportunity to see my mum and dad and i didn't recognize a place so many new blocks of flats but what they have is new blocks of flats that are going for 700 to a million plus and then for, for you know one bedroom two bedroom departments but then they've also got other two, three bedroom departments that are only for the locals and are being sold for two to 300,000. So it's you know. another part of the polarization that Ava was talking about. People obviously can't afford to buy, so they, they go on a waiting list to be able to get access to accommodation. And there's, there's a gradual polarization or gentrification, which is, isn't healthy for a community. So. Um, you know, I, I don't know what, what, you know how it's going to turn out, but it's uh, it certainly needs work. Yeah, I mean, Just, huge issue. Sorry, go on over. There, I was quickly going to mention, Alan, you were talking about developers, and in the United States, what has happened is that the new build, the new development, is about thirty to thirty-five percent more expensive than the resale, and for re the reason for that is that the lumber prices here have absolutely skyrocketed. It is. It has twisted the whole real estate market into a place that we haven't seen before. Wow. Yeah, and it's well, it's it's interesting in Europe. They have a lot more uh, rental. You know, a lot of private um, owners of popular of flats who 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 rent, and people are quite happy to live all their lives renting because it's a stable, fair arrangement. Whereas in this country, we've been Thatcher made us believe we all could could get enough money to buy a property. And uh, I think that might be, that aspiration might come around to haunt us as a population. The, the other thing that I noticed in Europe, certainly in, in the France and Spain, I can't really speak about the other areas, but they're much more um, city centric. So, or, or town centric, people want to be living within walking distance so that they're not having to step in or get into a car to do their shopping. So the properties in the outskirts in the in rural areas actually don't have the same type of value and and desire that we've got going on over here. 
Mm. Wow. Yeah. I find fascinating. Ladies um, and gentlemen, to, I'm, going to, to, I'm going to bring this to a close and ask everyone to stay on, but I'm going to close the recording. I wanted to say a huge thanks to our panel, extraordinary panel tonight, uh, Jane Gunn, Graham Jones, Tim Durkin, Godfrey Lancashire and Gabriel uh, Gache. So if you'd all, if you'd give them a big round of applause and a cheer in the normal way, that would be uh, absolutely fantastic. And um, thanks for joining me. Now, next week we have our uh, 93rd show and that's the anniversary show of exactly a year since I had this uh, idea to run it. So bring your glass of wine, bring your beer. Uh, I'm going to invite all our previous guests to join us. I don't know whether we'll, we'll get them or not, but let's see if we can beat the record for the number of people that uh, we've had on, and that's actually 57 registered. So that's, uh, that's going to be really tricky. But if we can do that, have a bit of fun, um, tell each other one or two stories, that will be uh, absolutely brilliant. So thanks for joining me. If you're watching this on YouTube, please uh, like it. If you liked it, if you listen to this on the Negotiators podcast, please say some good words, and I look forward to seeing you shortly. I'm Derek Arden. Have a fabulous week.